Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day three, I guess it is, of Davos. Um, as some of you will have noticed, the question of migration and displacement, at least to my mind, is a little less high on the agenda than it might otherwise have been. And from my perspective, that is a mistake. We're hearing a lot about Ukraine. We're hearing a lot about the economy. We're not hearing so much about uh, refugees. I'm the CEO of the New Humanitarian. It's a nonprofit newsroom that reports about humanitarian crises around the world. And of course, that includes uh, the impacts uh, and displacement is one big part of that. And uh, what we're seeing is that, if anything, things are, are getting much worse vis-a-vis -vis displacement uh, due to the impacts of the invasion of the Ukraine, the long-standing implications of um, COVID, hunger, et cetera. And, and so actually millions of people are, are we, we don't talk about it anymore, but still leaving their homes. Uh, last year, 100 million people were forcibly displaced, and that is a huge, huge increase, as many of us know, over previous years. Um, so this remains a, a dominant issue, and we know that um, employment can be a, a major way in which refugees can better integrate into their societies. Unfortunately, um, that isn't always happening, and we, the New Humanitarian, publish every year a list of trends that drive humanitarian needs, and mismanaged migration is, is right up there on the list. Uh, there is, uh, as we all know, one shining um, exception to that rule, and that is the reception of Ukrainian refugees in Europe, which uh, received huge, huge public and private support. Um, so our goal today is to learn some lessons from that and see how that can be extended to uh, wider refugee crises around the world. And uh, last year, the World Economic Forum launched an initiative um, called the Refugee Employment and Employability Initiative to try to accelerate some of that momentum that was seen off the back of the Ukraine crisis. So one year on from that, what lessons can be learned from uh, the experience of the private sector in trying to increase employment and succeeding, really, in, in increasing employment opportunities for refugees? Um, so they learned four lessons in, in consulting with a community of chief HR officers and um, participating companies. And you see them up on the screen there. The need for legal and timely access to local labor markets the need to reduce reliance on language fluency and to prioritize skills uh, first, the need to create visibility of vacancies and proactively support job matching, and finally, to look more broadly than just the employment at, at wider social uh, cohesion and integration. So those are gonna act as starting points for our conversation. Um, and I will just say that, that as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Ukraine response has really been so unique that um, it has shown that it is possible to do better than the world has historically done when it comes to receiving and integrating refugees. And so how do we scale those learnings and apply them elsewhere? So I want to start with Ahmed. Ahmed Jude is a, a dancer and um, a Syrian refugee. He was born as a stateless person in Syria and then fled again to the Netherlands um, during the war in Syria. And um, you are now part of the National Ballet. Yes. Which is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but I, I'm sure it wasn't a very easy road to get there. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience as a refugee and some of these questions that we're talking about. How did they apply in your case in terms of how easy that integration experience was? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you for having me here. Um, first of all, like, I always like to start with what is refugee? Right? Like, what does that mean? What, who are those people? Can we be these people next or what? So if we start like having conversations, having this in mind first. And how can a person be born as a refugee? Which is my case. I did not ask for refugee asylum in Syria. I was born like that. Because my father is a stateless refugee. His father was from Palestine a Palestinian refugee in uh, Damascus, Syria. I have a Syrian mother, but <laughs> women, they cannot give nationalities to their kids, so we remained stateless. It happened that I wanted to become a ballet dancer, which was like very, very difficult, and it's a very demanding career, if you have <laughs> any idea about it, especially if you uh, learn the Vaganova style, which is the Russian style, Ukrainian style, I mean Vaganova. So it's very, dictatorship and dance and all of this stuff, you know, like with... No less as an Arab man, I would think. Oh, God, no. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, for me, it was always challenging, like, to find myself within um, 
any community where I am in, you know, like I was invited by the Dutch National Ballet to join the Dutch National Ballet in the Netherlands, where I also moved to the Netherlands in a student visa. But I was called all the time as the refugee. I have no obligation to ask for refugee asylum anywhere in the world. But then, of course, as a stateless person, after three years living in the Netherlands, you get, you get the nationality. And I tend to say stateless, everyone asks me why, because I lived in the Yarmouk camp in Damascus knowing that, that I am half Palestinian and half Syrian. But then when I moved to the Netherlands, I got my permit and written their nationality stateless. And then I thought, wow, this needs to be told to the world because we need to change this. Like the first human right is to be a nationality and belonging. So tell me a bit more about the belonging. How, what was the process for you in, in finding belonging in the Netherlands and to what extent did it go well in terms of support in being able to, to match your, in particular in this case, your very unique skills with a job opportunity? Well, uh, I think finding, it, there is a complexity of belonging for refugees in general. Like we are pushed away everywhere. They think like them and us and whatever. But now we are having like, for example, the crisis with the Ukrainian refugees, which, which tells the world not only Middle Easterns can be refugees or where, whatever other country, which means, would you please treat everyone the same? Because hopefully not, but maybe you are next. So would we please treat each other as we would like to be treated? And I found home, home in the Netherlands because I was appreciated as an artist, as a person, and as a citizen. I lived uh, 26 years of my life in Arab countries and I was not recognized as a citizen. Mm. The first nationality and the first passport ever I have is the Dutch, which is two years ago only. So it feels good to be a citizen somewhere. And how important was the ballet part, in other words, your professional career, in that sense of being seen and valued? Ballet is, a, as, as I said, is a very demanding career which based on the body. Your instrument is your body. No one can take it from you. If you are a refugee or a citizen or whatever nationality you have, no one can take your body from you. They can take your home, they bombed my house, Five people of my family were killed. They took all of this. They took my childhood, but they couldn't take my body, which I kept working on. And I kept like, appreciating and taking care of this instrument that gave me a life. So I'm investing in my own body, well, I'm, <laughs> which I'm no one the, can take from I'm me. I'm glad the Dutch government is also recognizing that and <laughs> investing in it as well. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I want to turn next to Zina Tukenis to my left. Uh, Minister of Planning and International Cooperation of Jordan. Um, Zina, we saw certainly in the case of Ukraine the way the European Union opened up its labor market completely and how transformative that was in terms of allowing Ukrainian refugees to access jobs. Tell us a bit about Jordan's experience with Syrian refugees and how you changed your policies as a government to open up some space. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hiba, and thank you for having me and for the introduction. Uh, um, 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 let me start by putting just putting few figures and just to put things into context. 30% um, of Jordanian population is a refugee, has a refugee status, either registered with the UNHCR or, the, the, or with the UNRWA. 11% um, are Syrian uh, refugees and it has been um, um, we've been basically living this refugee uh, crisis for almost a decade now. Uh, and um, we started changing our policies with time. We started, you know, it started as a humanitarian uh, that you needed to provide um, refugees with, uh, with the basic needs, uh, mainly food and shelter. We transitioned into a more of a resilience-based approach. And we started developing uh, what is known as the, a series of what is known as the Jordan Response Plan, um, in the sense that uh, it's no longer uh, a humanitarian crisis, but it's, it's becoming more of a development crisis. And there are uh, host communities that are being impacted uh, uh, daily. Moving forward 2016, um, we developed a more of a holistic approach, trying to look at refugees as 
um, um, uh, um, an economic uh, resource and trying to use them more in a productive, uh, to, be, to provide them the means to be able uh, to provide, you know, to, for them to work uh, um, and skill them uh, in this regard. And what we adopted then, what is known as the Jordan Compact. Um, um, we focused mainly in the Jordan Compact, um, expanded on uh, in addition to basic services, we expanded on two main uh, key components, livelihood, education, and skilling. Education uh, and skilling, we opened up, you know, the refugees have uh, access, free access to schools, opened up vocational training, which was only limited to Jordanians, um, uh, expanded on catch-up programs, so just to ensure that you're not leaving a lost generation behind and you're bridging gaps, uh, the years that they have missed or the number of months that they have missed in terms of education. Uh, we reintroduced um, uh, um, double shift schools, uh, um, built over 62 university, uh, 62 schools in, in camps, uh, provided scholarships to the universities, um, and uh, skilling, making them digitally enabled, vocational training, apprenticeship programs, internship, uh, with tens of programs that came uh, online. And I have said that it was a government policy, but there was do donor support as well that helped us to move forward on that front. On the livelihood um, um, and following... Minister, can I just jump in? Because, sorry, like you've talked a lot about the, the preparation for the job market and what you do to get them into a space where they can actually... Um, be ready for it, and yet most Syrian refugees in Jordan do, cannot access work permits. They are limited to um, certain fields of work that are open to non-Jordanians, and that is a minority of the overall refugee population. So, so tell us a little bit about the constraints for you as a government, whether they are um, economic or, or, frankly, political, in being able to really open up the, the labor market. So opening up the labor market even... Uh, with, with the limitations that we have, it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy policy decision uh, because of the economic challenges that Jordan is facing, because of the crisis in the region, the toll, the, uh, you know, the series of crises that, that are mostly exogenous shocks, uh, from the financial uh, financial crisis to the Arab Spring to the Syrian uh, to the Syrian crisis, uh, and now into the pandemic and the most recent to the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Well, all of this had an impact on the Jordanian economy. Uh, yet, uh, we started opening up um, a number of economic sectors, providing um, uh, a free of charge work permits, flexible employment, that means that they can move from one job to another. And this happened, progressed over, the, over a few years. Uh, this year, for instance, we, we, we waived the fees of work permits for the seventh year in a row. Um, um, you know, we, we developed, we had these uh, employment centers to help on the matchmaking as a platform for matchmaking. We reached a deal with the European Union on relaxing the rules of origin under the EU Jordan Association Agreement where private sector, if they employ uh, Syrians and make use of the, of the skills that, you know, there are unique skills that the Syrians also continue to, to hold. Uh, they'll be able to access the EU market uh, um, um, in a more relaxed uh, approach. Uh, so we, we tried to look into the, the various areas to be able to integrate them um, uh, cautiously within the economy, even with limitation. And I would tell you bluntly, it's, we have a very high unemployment rate that has increased with the Syrian crisis from around 13%. Now we, we, we hit 23% uh, unemployment rate. With youth, unemployment is at 45% uh, uh, that high. So, so that's it's, exactly... It's, it's very difficult to, you know, while you're, you're trying to uh, provide equal access um, on various um, basic services, on the employment, it, it, it was very difficult, yet we tried to look at them as a, as a productive resource, trying to replace foreign laborers with Syrians, yet they're competing, they've been competing with Jordanians. Um, over the past few years, we've, with, we, we've issue, issued around 350,000 work permits. Uh, yet studies by Fafo and others, uh, World, and World Bank, it showed that for every one formal uh, Syrians, formal worker, there are two that are, are working informally. Mm. 
So how do you, what lessons have you learned in terms of how to overcome what I see as really political disincentives to open up the labor market to refugees? Because then your own people say, we want those jobs. How do you overcome that as a government? Listen, so far the, 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 the Jordanian community have been basically embraced the Syrians. There were no frictions. But it, it, it was very difficult, you know, at the policy level to make these decisions. You know, we started opening up certain sectors, then moved to the uh, flexible employment. That means that they can roam around to give them the flexibility to make the livelihood and the skilling. Uh, we started with education, but the skilling was not part of that. Uh, so skilling came uh, at an advanced right. stage. Uh, um, um, we completely understand, you know, we opened up our borders for Syrians. So we tried to... to, to to set a regional and global model for dealing with Syrians, but and and but there is a uh, and been carrying a global public good since then, mm -hmm. but there is also a, lim a, a, a limitation when it comes to carrying capacity. And then and the we've question seen of the donor support. You yeah. know, attention has been shifted elsewhere uh, with the pandemic, with Ukraine, which we cannot carry without sustained support moving forward. And your point about um, the the role of the, the private sector also is important. We'll turn to that now because often the legal barriers to employment are used as the reason why, you know, that's the obstacle the, the law doesn't allow us. But there are actually many instances in which the legal framework is open enough to refugees and yet we still don't see refugees getting jobs and that then comes to and the private I mean, sector. Before you uh, yeah. probably move forward, we uh, form regulated and formalized home-based businesses for Syrians just to be able for them to be able to do their own businesses, provided access uh, to finance through MAC, uh, MFIs and others. So we tried you know, to look at it from its entirety to, to, to help on that domain. Sorry. No, no, good transition for me. So I'm going to turn to Hassan al Houri, who is the chairman of Menzies Aviation. Um, Hassan, one of the lessons that we see up there on the screen from the WEF's initiative was that employers need to be more proactive in A, identifying um, job matches and then be creating visibility for vacancy. So uh, Menzies, as I understand it, contacted Ukrainian airports and ground um, handling companies and said, here are the offers that we've got within our network. Um, and then the, the Ukrainian refugees that you did hire, about 20, um, you ultimately funded local language courses for them. So walk us through a little bit, what, um, was that difficult to do? Did that take a real kind of rethink? And, and what lessons you learned from that that others can draw? So, Heba, I'd like to start with a personal uh, uh, note, because this subject is, is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm of Lebanese and Palestinian origin, and as we know, there are six million Palestinian refugees around the world, largely in Jordan, Syria, Pal uh, Lebanon, and Egypt. And Lebanon is the one country with the highest per capita number of refugees around the world. And Lebanon is already a, a small and poor and poorly governed country. So Lebanon is struggling. The second thing is, in 1990, I was living in Kuwait. And when Iraq invaded Kuwait, we were forcibly displaced. So while we did not have the legal term refugee, we were displaced. And we had to drive for, for days through the desert. And we ultimately ended up in Cyprus uh, for two years and then moved back to Kuwait. And I understand what Ahmed said. Nobody wants to be a refugee. Nobody chooses to be a refugee. It's imposed on people. Um, and businesses need to take a proactive approach to assimilate these refugees into the workforce. Because these refugees, today, they will be our colleagues. They will be classmates to our children. They'll be our neighbors. And hopefully, they become productive members of society. And they become entrepreneurs and investors. And we assimilate them. What the refugee ultimately wants is dignity and belonging. right? They want to be productive in society. And that's what we should give them. In regards to what we, we've done, yes, we took a proactive approach. We contacted Ukrainian airports. We asked for the names of em employees in Ukrainian airports who had left Ukraine. We tried to track them down wherever we could, largely in London and Prague. We were able to uh, find them jobs in our operations. We started with English language courses just to make sure that we were able to communicate effectively. But fortunately, airport operations are largely not, a, not entirely, but largely similar and transferable from one airport to the other. So we were able to assimilate them within our own workforce, and they've been, been very productive. It's been, it's been great. 
But how did you make that case? I, I mean, you're the boss, so I guess you don't have to make the case to anyone. But um, for other businesses that might get a bit of uh, resistance, uh, you know, how do you? How easy was it, and and is it really that that far off for others to be able to do the same? So we have we have a specific we have specific needs and challenges. As we all know, uh, airports around the world after COVID are struggling with labor, and so the case was easy to make. We need people, right? In Europe, in the UK, in the US, we need people. So that was an easy case to make. The challenge that we have is that airports are a very sensitive part of the infrastructure. Mm. And anybody who wants to work at an airport needs to have a very thorough background check. For refugees, that's a lot harder because you don't have you know, five years of, of police records and tax records and so on and so forth. But thankfully, I think local and regional governments were supportive and airport authorities were also supportive. So we were able to, to expedite the process. But that is a challenge that we have. But that's specific to the airport industry. Yeah, but I think that this question of credentials, as, as um, also came up in, in the WEF's uh, initiatives, Lessons Learned, is, is an obstacle often, that there isn't. Um, and although, again, in the case of Ukraine, there was a solution to that, um, whereby the EU was able to give guidance to those who check credentials on what U Ukrainian credentials look like, and thus speed up that process as well. Um, but I, I would suspect that's a common challenge for others. Becky, I wanted to turn to you. Um, Becky, Becky Frank, pronounce your last name for us. Frankowitz. Frankowitz, thank you. Um, Chief Commercial Officer at the Manpower Group and um, President for North America. Um, a recurring kind of theme to the Ukrainian response was this, this creation of visibility for vacancies. You've done that in many other contexts as well uh, for Afghans in the US. Um, for Syrians in, in Germany. Walk us through some of your lessons learned from your experiences in, in trying to connect refugees with jobs. Yeah, so first I would say our experience tells us that employment is a passport to integration. Um, it's a way to join a community, to make friends, to truly become part of something new. And, and we've seen that play out. We did a lot of work uh, in Syria and to Germany, um, helping people find centers similar to the employment centers you mentioned. Um, we set up employment centers. Um, we did a lot for Ukraine into Poland and the surrounding communities. And probably the most developed example that we have is Afghan refugees into the U.S. Uh, in partnership with Welcome U.S., Accenture and Manpower Group, um, opened an exchange, like the Welcome Exchange platform. They gave real-time access to refugees and brought them job opportunities with skills that they would self-define. And so they could come in at any point, match their skills, and, and get a job. Um, that in involved us convening employers who were also <coughs> passionate like you are about this topic. So we went in the marketplace. We have over 500 employers now, 90,000 jobs on this platform in the U.S. for refugees. Now, some lessons learned, because we talked about that before. Um, so, of course, we had language capability on the website. We had thought of all that. The interesting problem became, in the workplace, what if no one spoke English? And we did offer language training, but it, they couldn't learn fast enough for the means to need to, to make a living. And so we negotiated with clients and said, OK, if one person out of 10 can speak English, can they represent the other nine? And so that was a lesson learned, because we'd solved it everywhere else until we got to the workplace. And so that was one of the, um, I think, biggest breakthroughs we had, so that we could put groups of people to work. But it really has been you know, real-time access, convening. And then you talked about skills, um, or you talked about skills. Skill adjacency became very important. So in Syria, if you're a welder, that may not translate into Germany with your credentials. So we had to be able to say, OK, what are your actual skills, and how does that translate into the new country where you're seeking employment? But how do you do that in a way that isn't super labor intensive because that's going to off put, I would think, many employers if they have to invest that much in a, such a manual way. We made it quite easy for them by building this exchange. I mean, it's literally a website that you go in, it's in multiple languages, and you say, here are my skills. What are the job openings that match my skills? So really, it's, it's a light touch on the employer. One other question for you, in, in kind of looking at the way job markets are changing and skills, the skills that are needed are changing, how are you thinking about upskilling and reskilling refugees in particular to prepare them for the future of work? Yeah, so one, again, is we really focus on skill adjacency. So we know what a skill is. We know where the demand is. How do we upskill and train on that? just like we would do with a po in any population, to be honest, refugees included. Um, secondly, we try to find 
large pockets of opportunity so we can put these pods of groups together so language doesn't become a barrier. But we all have to be upskilled. I mean, the, the WEF data said that 50% of the global population has to upskill in the next two years, not 10 years, two years. And so this concept of upskilling isn't just a refugee need, it's a humanity need. But I, I would imagine that the sometimes the gap, so Hassan, you talked about, you know, the, it's, it's easy when you're talking about airports because, mm -hmm. You know, it's a similarly transferable skill set for the knowledge economy that might be a bit more complicated. Well, it really depends. So we've found, you know, pockets of skill. I mean, the, the good or bad in our global labor economy today is we hit a 16-year high in terms of skill gap. And so skill gap is a universally accepted problem that we have now. Um, and so it's great that we can upskill. There's, there's various upskilling programs that can meet people where they are and match them to opportunity. A question for all of you, though, perhaps most of you, Hassan, um, you know, we can talk about rescaling, we can talk about um, how do you get vacancy platforms, et cetera, uh, but if states and companies don't have the willingness to act with others the way they did with Ukrainians, because they had a geopolitical interest, because they were white, blue-eyed refugees that looked like us, uh, does any of this matter if you can't get, how do you overcome that, that barrier? I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. And, and I say you're an exception because you're clearly enlightened and have a refugee background yourself, which not all employers will. I, I don't think there's a one-size that, that fits all of the situation. So the U.S. was very welcoming to Afghans that were supporting the U.S. in their operations in, in Afghanistan. And we actually work with some of those Afghan refugees in the U.S. We've, we've trained them at least in, you know, within the airport operations, and they've been integrated. I don't think there was a similar response from most of the Arab world, not all of the Arab world, with regards to the Palestinians. Um, you know, in, in Lebanon, for example, there's more than 100 professions that, that Palestinian refugees cannot take up. So if you are a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon, you can't choose any profession that you want, even if you are educated and experienced in that particular field. Um, so. Yes, a, a global or at least a regional concerted effort around accepting the refugees needs to be there. With the Ukrainians, I think Ukraine was fortunate in that sense, and Europe was very open, and the rest of the world was too. But it wasn't for everyone else. M most of the refugees around the world come from six countries, Palestine, Afghanistan, Syria, South Sudan, um, and a couple others. That's not the case for, for the rest of the countries. It, it is a specific case for Ukraine. I just want to add to that. I think the other benefit, if we can call it that, in the current situation is we need workers. And we is everywhere. Everywhere needs workers. And so I think you know, the, the commentary you made on how people look, I think diversity is in the front seat now. And that includes refugees. And it includes people who look, think, and act differently. But we say that, and yet you know, we're still seeing a massive obstacle for most refugees. So where's the gap between the, the facts as you see them, which is that there is a need, and then the reality, which is that these guys aren't getting hired? I, th I think, again, we need more pr uh, platform programs where people can find the match for their skill with employment. I mean, that's because it's not the shortage of, of demand, right? Like, there are jobs open around the world, and we have a shortage of supply. And so we have to figure out how we convene companies like we have done, bring companies together, bring supply together, and do the match. Uh, one more question for you, Minister, and then I'm going to turn to the audience for your questions. The uh, general sentiment around the response to Ukrainian refugees was that this would float all boats, right? This would show the world what was possible and that a, a more enlightened and um, kind of forward-looking approach to integrating refugees would become the new norm. In your experience, being home to as many Syrian refugees as you are, have you seen that that has helped float the boat for Syrian refugees? No. Unfortunately, no. Attention diverted elsewhere when it comes to Syrian refugees. Uh, especially, and we have seen that with, with the diminishing, do, diminishing donor support. Uh, our response plan is, uh, as I told you, is 30% funded of the actual required needs. And this is, has taken a lot of toll on, uh, on the economy, on the, on the government budget to be able to maintain uh, quality services, not only to refugees, but also to Jordanians. Um, and I, again, we're, we, um, we remain open 
but it cannot be opened uh, without you know certain restrictions because of the high unemployment and we're struggling to find jobs for our uh, for for Jordanian youth uh, and this is where you need um, different actors coming together including the private sector to be able to help uh, on that domain private sector CSOs uh, uh, international community, not only the government alone cannot, cannot do it. Questions from the audience, if there are any. I see one in the front and then one in the back. Hello, my name is Yasmina Filali. I'm uh, from Morocco. I operate uh, with my foundation uh, for refugees and migrants uh, in Italy and Morocco in both countries. Uh, I would say that on the holistic integration, there is a very uh, important topic, which is to change the narrative about the migration and refugees in order to uh, comfort the private sector. And I think that, uh, today you're the best ambassador to uh, make it happen because it's all about storytelling in, in terms of changing the, the narratives. And, uh, for example, there is uh, uh, all in, in Europe, tourism is asking for, uh, for workers. Mm -hmm. And now we can see that in tourism, a lot of refugees uh, are uh, coming into, which is a, a very important thing. But on the other side, private sector and companies ask us to prepare the team mm -hmm. to receive them. Because this is something very important. To integrate refugees, it's... Uh, Beautiful thing, but what about uh, hand, the companies that have thousands of people and that it, they uh, see them arrive? How do they accept that? Thank you. Yeah, can I just comment on that? I think it's such an insightful second comment that you made around how do you prepare the team to receive both sides of the equation are essential. So I appreciate that comment. Do you have an answer to it? Yeah, well, it's the same thing. We're doing the exact same. The, 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 you prepare the teams. You do training to actually welcome the refugees into the workplace. Um, it's, it, it's essential. But if you only do one side, one side's critical. Get the placement. Second is how do you get welcome, um, welcoming bodies. We've done the same thing um, with you know, minor offenses in terms of people who are coming out of prison in, in the United States. We help them find jobs, but then prepare the team to welcome them into the team. And Ahmed, maybe just to get your thoughts on this, what was yeah. your experience? Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I think like refugees coming to Europe, we always forget about the culture shock. Mm -hmm. Like when you go to Europe and have this big culture shock and holding all the PTSD traumas with you, with, what, with whatever you mm -hmm. experienced during the war, you are not aware of that. And how could you know about the platforms where to find job mm -hmm. while you are already struggling with your mental health? I think that's take, like with me, it took three years and a half. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I have the dance to express this and take it out of my body. I went to therapy during Corona for like a year and I fixed my PTSD, but I noticed that and I was very lucky to notice this <laughs> in me. But some people, they need to be told, you need help before starting anything else. You need to be educated about your mental health, about your skills and how to improve this after you fix your problems. Mm -hmm. and when you have the culture shock or, or the PTSD, you are not aware about that. And if you are aware about it, you are going to deny it. So I think it should be also implemented in the programs that supports refugees uh, to integrate, is to keep this in mind. Mm. And in your experience, when you might be a, a unique case in that the, you know, they kind of came to you, I suppose. You. Um, but for others that you know in your community, how easy was it for them to find these platforms that, for instance, Manpower Group is creating? It's not easy. Because, first of all, the language barrier, that's one. Uh, second of all, we come from countries that doesn't have that big of access for internet. And especially in Syria, even now, we don't have, uh, like, I talk to my mother every day. She's like, we're cold. We don't have water. We don't have, uh, got, uh, like, electricity. We have nothing. And you're meeting the leaders of the world. Tell them this. <laughs> so this is not accessible. So we come from these kind of countries where we don't know the platforms, like the websites or online platforms for work. So also, I think this should be told to these people when they are received in the refugee camp. And I think all these programs has to start there. Because the moment you just arrive and you do nothing, stay there and wait for your permit, 
you're not going to be motivated. But it really speaks to the need for the linkages between all the pieces of the puzzle, right? That, that the employers are working with the civil society organizations that are working in these more holistic integration methods and ensuring that they're directing them to the services that you're setting up in an environment that you have set up that is enabling all of this. So it, it really highlights the need for um, me here, uh, less silos. Um, from our experience, we did provide these legal services, uh, whether on the legal side, but also on the uh, psychosocial side, and also when receiving uh, you know, refugees, telling them about uh, you know, uh, addressing their needs. Uh, so these were programs that have been uh, ongoing for a decade now uh, in the Jordan case. I know there's a question in the back and then one in the front and then in the middle, yes. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Deng from uh, Kakuma Refugee Camp. I'm a global shaper. And uh, they this topic, accelerating refugees employment is of much interest to me since I'm also a refugee. And in your discussion, so uh, there's a few things that I've tried to highlight. And uh, one thing is about reskilling. The other thing is about who is to employ refugees. And this is where my question is going to be best. So like, if there's this program for reskilling refugees and connects them to jobs. You see, when I'm living from the country that I'm living from, if I'm a carpenter, the same skill can still be there, you see. So the only difference might be the cultural shock that my colleague has said. So if you are giving out these skills to the refugees that are coming in, what kind of skills are you giving them? Because from where I'm coming from, people are, they can, you can be taken for six month training and given that certificate, you go home with it, mm. but you will not get an employment with it. Sure. So it matters how relevant is the skills that you are giving to the refugees here, and how sustainable is it to them? Have you tried mostly the digital skills because now the world is moving out of traditional work and going for the digi digital skills, whereby when this refugee has been settled, if I'm settled in this room, must I go out for me to work? Thank you very much, and it's so great to have such a rich refugee presence here to challenge, I think, some of the narratives that we might tell ourselves. Let's take the two other questions and then come back to the panel. Hi. Yeah, my name is Nelly, and I'm working in the Netherlands for a refugee company, so Hello. I'm very happy to hear that you are in a good Thank place. You and um, I wanted to say two things about your story. Um, I think the start is very important. When I started for the refugee company a few years ago, and I found a job as a volunteer for one of my clients, and she was not allowed to do the volunteers work because it was an, uh, um, they have to do a lot of administration. She still have to do a course to learn Dutch, but the company where she could work as a volunteer, they were very happy if she could come there because they told her, you can learn here the Dutch language, we are very happy with your skills, but she was not allowed to do that work as a volunteer. Now, fortunately, the rules are a little bit changed, but that is one of the things. And the second, Ed, that you uh, tell uh, your story about the culture shock, I want to uh, tell an example. I was coaching a client and she came from Pakistan and she had a job, but um, she was not used uh, to ask questions because that was not allowed in Pakistan. You have to do your job and you can't ask questions because then maybe they say, oh, you are not good. And so um, now her contract wasn't, um, was, uh, wasn't uh, made longer, but of, uh, fortunately uh, she got uh, the possibility to get a coach. So I was coaching her and told her about the labor market in the Netherlands and that it is better to ask questions than not to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And then she was happy and now she found another job and she's asking questions. So thank you very yeah. much, Nelly. Thank you for sharing. Great staying. example. And one final question. 
before I ask my question, I'll just say that uh, I just watched in uh, Netflix uh, The Swimmer. Oh, the Swimmer is right. about the Maldini system. Uh, for people like me it, that never had this uh, personal experience, it helps you feel what it is. It speaks to the storytelling aspect exactly, that was raised exactly. earlier. So uh, I highly recommend. Um, I worked for 23 years in Africa, but I actually live in Cyprus. And I have a specific question on that to the panel. Uh, we've heard about economies that needs to balance, but what we see in Cyprus is that there's a lot of refugee coming, uh, but the economy cannot absorb it. It's a tiny economy. It's not that uh, which jobs will the economy give to the refugee. It cannot, actually cannot absorb it. So what I wanted to ask is this. Do, do you have any example, or have you seen any example that uh, a, a refugee community or refugee base can create um, anything which is, I don't know, commercial, self-sustaining self, uh, uh, within an economy that cannot absorb it? Have you seen any successful example of that? I think in the Netherlands I might take this one. In the Netherlands we have a program that you can just go to the municipality and say, I want to work. And then they can help you in finding coaching or finding courses that you need, and then you can get in there. But as if you have a passport, but as a stateless refugee, you're not allowed a visa. You're not even in the system. You're, you don't have a country to talk to you if, if, about on, on your behalf. And that is a very big problem that I faced in my career as a ballet dancer traveling the world. I would not be given a visa unless I am invited by the king or the president or these kind of stuff. So I also would like to say, let's also think of the stateless refugees who don't have a passport to prove where they are from. We have two uh, um, words in the Netherlands, which is statlos or nationality unbekannt, which is stateless or nationality unknown. And that's also given to the Palestinian origin refugees in Syria or in Lebanon when they come. And that's a very big barrier in the, in, in, in like the labor market for them. Uh, I'll add a point uh, to the question that you raised earlier. Um, companies, and I think society generally, needs to view refugees not as a burden. But the question is, how do we transition them from refugees to productive members of society? And when you do that transition, you're, you're changing the size of the economy, and the size of the consumer base from this big to this big. So. The question is, and I don't want to you know, single out Cyprus or any one particular uh, country, but you, know, you have these refugees coming. The economy is this big. Well, your consumer base is growing now by 5% or 10%. Mm. If you keep the refugees on the fringes of society, well, yes, they are a burden. They're a burden on the health care, the education, you know, everything else. But if they become productive members of society, you're growing the size of the economy. And that's good for everybody. Becky, do you want to take the question on um, how relevant the skilling is in the digital economy? Yeah, so I think in very incredibly relevant. Um, you know, what, again, what we have focused on is helping people become productive in their own definition immediately. And so we try to match current skills, adjacent skills to demand so that people can become integrated very quickly. Um, then you can think about, you know, what kind of reskilling do you want to invest in? And digital obviously is a critical place to have ongoing employment. You know, we call it future proofing. Um, digital skills, and I would say some, some possibly more accessible skills around um, health care, uh, child care, things like that. Uh, teaching even, you know, there's a, a global shortage of teachers. Teachers are on strike around the world. So there's opportunities to plug in. I, I think it's, it's probably narrow to say everyone needs to do digital. For sure, people, we want people to do digital. But we have to have many on-ramps into various areas that match the skills they're starting with. Um, Minister, I think there are two questions that I'd love to throw at you. One was the, you know, uh, the legal um, restrictions around volunteer work for those who might not have the right documentation. And then basically Ahmed's point around stateless and how are you handling those kinds of profiles? Uh, the, the status that we have in Jordan that you have to have to be a re registered refugee. Uh, so we don't have the stateless... Uh, so what happens to them? Uh, um, they're, they're, they're part... They're, I don't think we have... I don't think we, we, we have much in this categorization because most of them, they're basically... They're uh, registered, registered, end up registered. They're registered okay. refugees. Uh, although we have few nationalities that, uh, you know, Yemenis, uh, 
uh, Sudanese that came in, but uh, uh, they're open to go register with the, with the UNHCR uh, to get the refugee uh, to the, get the refugee status. Uh, sorry, what was the other? The, vo the point around you know even for refugees to try to volunteer, they're not allowed to do that legally. Um, Listen, it's very difficult. In Jordan, it's very difficult. I, I see Hassan's point. I see the rest of the points. But again, I, I agree with the gentleman. It's, it's a very small economy, and the challenges are enormous. Uh, uh, on the contrary, you know, they can volunteer. I don't think there are restrictions. Uh, yet, in, in, uh, probably in certain and specific professions. It's not open to every profession. Uh, on the contrary, there are no restrictions when it comes to volunteerism. You can see the clock, we're out of time. So I'm gonna ask each of you in one line, I promise I will cut you off if it's not one line. If there is one takeaway or learning for you that others can learn from in terms of how to scale this approach that you're all trying in one way or another to um, support, what would it be? Hassan. There is hope, we're getting better. That's at the abstract level, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Convene employers and make demand or supply accessible. Before giving a job, give a nationality for people who needs it. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go talk about hope. Hopefully, uh, again, <laughs> echo what Hassan just said. There is hope, hopefully there's hope. Well, thank you all very much. Hopefully you've gotten a few um, bits and pieces from that in terms of practical tips. I will say that the WEF is looking for more members uh, from the corporate sector for its refugee employment initiative. So if you are interested, find someone in the room and they will sign you up. And for those who are more broadly interested in uh, how refugees are being uh, treated around the world, you can also sign up to our reporting, the new humanitarian.org slash subscribe to follow um, what I, I hope is often a reality check about what's really going on on the ground in many of these contexts. Thank you very much for your attention and for being here, and thank you to all of you.